and then do a word game with it. Okay? And so the wife of Baal, which to the Phoenicians was great because Jezebel was a Baal worshipper. Mm. And so the wife of Baal is like saying something like the bride of Christ, you know, the bride of Baal. It's actually um, the opposite of the bride of Christ. The Jezebel spirit is also the spirit behind what we call Babylon in the book of Revelation. The great harlot, Babylon, that's Jezebel's spirit. Just to let you know, it's a counterfeit of the bride of Christ. Mm. Just as Ahab is a counterfeit of Christ, the Antichrist. Mm. Okay. So, the, the, the Jewish people, they twisted her name to mean without habitation or a woman that refuses to submit to the authority of her husband. That's what it means in the, in the Jewish language. A, a woman that refuses to come under the authority of her husband in the home. Refusing to acknowledge the authority of the man in the home as a husband. That's the Jezebel spirit. And because the, the thing is, the spirit is refusing to acknowledge God as bridegroom. And so that's why whenever it talks about Jezebel, it talks about sexual immorality or adultery. Mm. It talks about it here. And I'll explain that soon. Mm. But anyway, hopefully I'm not confusing you too much. And I'm going to go into more teaching on this next week because this is very important to understand. This is a real demonic strategy against the church and it's already being empowered. The, the feministic movement in the earth has actually empowered it. And in fact, there's a mind shift in many Christians in how they see the role of men and women in marriage. Um, I'm 100% for, in the church, women in leadership, by the way. I'm 100% for that, and I've got biblical evidence. I could sit down with you for hours and show you scripture where there can be women that are called prophets and even apostles in scripture. Uh, so I'm not saying a woman in, in authority or leadership is a Jezebel. In fact, if you say that, that's a wrong understanding of what we're talking about. But there are authority structures that God has set up. And in the marriage, the husband is to be the head under Christ. And the woman is to acknowledge and honour his authority in the home. Um, God, or in, in the New Testament, Jesus is the bridegroom. We need to acknowledge his authority. We are not equal to him in authority. Okay. Uh, by the way, I love the NIV Bible. And I've been using the NIV Bible since I got saved in 1987. And um, I do have other translations, New King James and the ESV, etc. But I just want to put out a warning to you. Um, I went to buy a new NIV last week because my NIV study Bible is dying. Okay, um, And so I decided that I need to get a resurrected NIV study Bible. And when I went to get it, I was shocked because there's certain scriptures that I check before I buy a Bible. And even though I'm buying the same Bible I've always used since 1987, I just thought, I'd better check the scriptures. And you know what happened? When it talks about the spirit and power of Elijah coming to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the children's to the fathers, they've changed the script. It's no longer fathers, it's parents now. Because what they've done is they've done a gender neutral translation of the Bible. And they've taken out the father and the, and, and the sons and now we're the children of God. It's a major attack on our identity of who God's created us to be, but also roles. So this is what we're dealing with here in this, this scripture. Is this spirit is behind the feminism movement. And they're trying to twist people's understanding of roles because God's image in the marriage, God's image in the home, God's image in the society, as God created it, they're trying to twist it to bring confusion. Okay, so nevertheless, I have this thing against you. You tolerate the woman Jezebel. Now, please note the, woman, the word tolerate. Uh, we looked at this. It was in one of our previous letters that in one of those churches, there was a false prophet called Balaam, and there was false teachers called the Nicolaitans, and, the, and they were tolerating their teaching. Doesn't mean they agreed with it, but they're tolerating. And, you know, toleration is the catch cry of this new move that's happening in the earth. And that's why I wanted to start with that point. You know what? We need to have love and truth in balance because if you take truth out of love, you don't have true love. That's right. 
And, and what's happening here, toleration is saying, we're going to accept anything as okay. But there's certain things that God says are not okay, we shouldn't accept them. And uh, it's interesting here because the many in the church were not actually following Jezebel. As we go through this, we'll see that there's a, there's a good number of people that were, but there's a, the, the elders weren't following Jezebel. But the elders were tolerating Jezebel. And the elders are getting rebuked because they tolerated Jezebel and her message and they didn't oppose it in the church. And uh, because they didn't oppose it, then Jezebel was able to come with her deceptions and the people she was deceiving were increasing in the church. You see, uh, the elders of the church need to be like watchmen, guarding and protecting the flock, like shepherds. Uh, guarding and protecting them, and yes, loving them. But the thing is, when you see a, 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 a spirit come into the church, you need to address it. And so, this woman, she calls herself a prophetess. It's very interesting. Jezebel, by the way, even in the Old Testament, she was the leader of the false prophets. And uh, Jezebel comes in now, and she's not declared by God as a prophet. She's not been commissioned by the elders of the church as a prophet in the church. She's not recognized by God and God's authorities as a prophet, but she has now declared herself a prophet. And because she's declared herself a prophet now, the elders are saying, okay, well, we'll just tolerate this. They shouldn't have tolerated it. They should say, we've not commissioned you, we've not recognized you within our church as a prophet. You do not have a right to come in with and do what you're doing. And so the sin of toleration, and we've got to understand that it is a sin. And again, Revelation is an end time book and, and toleration married together with political correctness is causing us to move into compromise. When you move into compromise, the walls of protection come crumbling down and the enemy can start to come in and rob and steal and destroy. Mm. Or just one example, you know, if you look at Islam, and, and Jesus loves Muslim people. He loves the Muslim people. We had Muslim friends when we were on the mission field. And we got on really well with them. I work out in the gym with some Muslim people. And we can be friends. Okay? But Islam is a demonic spirit. Muslim people are Muslim people. But Islam represents a demonic spirit. And its message is heinous and evil. And it promotes things like incest, having sex with children, marrying children. It promotes things like having sex slaves. And that's not considered adultery, by the way, in Islam. To us, that's adultery. But I just heard this Muslim woman praising the whole teaching about having sex slaves and how it stops Muslim men from committing adultery. Okay, But anyway, Islam is a demonic deception... And it's also got a militant wing in their scriptures. Use the sword to promote your faith. We use love to promote our faith. And we might do a, word of, a war of words, but we're not using the sword. You don't kill people to convert them in Christianity. So Islam is a, is a, is a major serious threat. Yet political correctness has disarmed the Western world. That's right, yeah. Where now, don't say anything against, if you, against the Muslims or against Islam. Don't even talk about, oh, he was an Islamic terrorist. They'll just say, oh, there was a terrorist there. You see, what's happened is the Western world has moved into deep, dark foolishness. Our walls of protection are coming down. And now Muslims are infiltrating our nations. And we're seeing things on the streets of Australia and in Europe and in America that we never would have seen 40 years ago. You can't tolerate everything. You've got to, there's, there's certain things that are wrong and there's certain things that are evil and we've got, to, we've got to build a wall of protection around ourselves. Otherwise, the enemy will walk in and out and he'll steal and rob and destroy our joy, our peace, our lives. Okay. We're literally facing a, a battle for the heart and soul and the security of our nations right now. And this was happening in this church because uh, they misunderstood love. and We need to love and accept Jesus loves sinners. 
He was a friend of sinners, which is pretty awesome. Uh, the, way you, the way you save a sinner is you love them into, into the kingdom. Amen? But Jesus loved sinners and hated sin. Because he saw the sin is the source of the cancer that causes their pain and their suffering. And Jesus, like the good physician, wants to get rid of the source of their pain. And he wants to set them free. And you can't set them free if you just give them a, a truthless love. That's right. So anyway, they're tolerating the woman Jezebel. She is promoting herself as a prophetess. And there's people in the church, not the leaders... But there's people in the church that are believing, wow, well, well, she really is a prophet. You know, like she really, she's really got prophetic insight and, and she, she's got spiritual understandings. And, and so she starts to gather a following in the church. Now she's teaching and misleading the servants of Jesus. It says, uh, by her teaching, she's misleading my servants. Jesus is saying, these are my servants. These are my people. And she's come in and she's misleading them. She's leading them down a wrong path of deception. I am not happy with this. Mm. Jesus is basically saying, I wish the leaders of the church in Thyatira were angry about this like I am. And I wish they'd act. But they haven't acted, so now I have to act. And when I act, by the way, the leaders themselves are going to be coming under a discipline because they failed to move in truth and love. They moved in tolerance. Okay, they're teaching them into sexual immorality and eating the food that's offered to idols. Now, when you read the Bible, you can instantly shut off because, oh, that's not even our day and age. You know, like, well, actually, I'm seeing idols everywhere at the moment. I've seen Christians with little Buddhas saying, it's just a little Buddha, you know, it's, it's just like a garden gnome, you know. And we just put this little Buddha there in our garden. It's just like a garden gnome and, you know, what? Ah, it's a Buddha. And Romans, Paul says in Romans, wherever you've got an idol, behind every idol there's a demon. And when you worship idols, you worship demons. It says that in Isaiah. Those that worship idols are actually being deceived. And they're worshipping demons. When you worship a demon, you give that demon greater authority to have access and control in your life. You literally are worshipping yourself into a curse. Okay. And this can be like pictures that you have and little idols that you allow and the little blessing scarves that you might get from a Buddhist monk or whatever it is. But see, what had happened in the city is this. Um, if you want to be involved, and it's a very rich city, very prosperous, uh, they had a lot of factories and the metal workers were very famous there, you see. And so they had these unions, they were called the, the workers' guilds. And to be a member of the Workers' Guild, each Workers' Guild had their own god that they worshipped. And so they had the, the Workers' Guild of the Woodworkers and the Workers' Guild of the Metal Workers. And, and so they all had their god and you go into their temple. If you want to join their Workers' Guild, you need to join them in their worship of their god. So when people became Christians, you know, you used to be a member of the, the Metal Workers Workers' Guild and you were worshipping the little metal worker god. And now you become a Christian. What are you going to do? You've got to renounce the false gods. When you renounce the false god, you stop going to their workers' guild party. And what they would do in their workers' guild party is they'd bring sacrifices and offerings to their gods. And then they'd have, drink alcohol and listen to really loud music and have sex with each other. Oh, it's just a oh, full-on sexual orgy. Sorry, but it's in the Bible. Kind of like a disco, you know. Go out there and pick up on people for sex. And so, when you become a Christian, you can't do that anymore. And so when you refuse to go, you lose your job. And I've lived in, in countries where people become Christians and they lose their job. When they lose their job, they lose their income. Then they've got to run around and they've got to try to scrounge up some money for their family. And, and often they can't pay their rent and they get kicked out of the home. And this was all happening in Thyatira. And so come, along comes this woman called Jezebel and she says, you know what? The freedom that we have in Christ is so great. His mercy and his compassion is so great. We can continue to do those things. You don't have to lose your job, your livelihood. You can continue in that worship, continue in that sexual immorality. You can continue in that because I tell you what, the grace of God is far greater than any sin. That was one of her teachings. 
And so there's some people didn't listen to her and they struggled. Financially struggled. And, and some of them had to take jobs that didn't have good incomes. Uh, but they did it anyway because they're suffering for Jesus. And they'd rather get the blessing of Jesus than the blessings of the world system. However, there were people that started to listen to Jezebel. And they, they'd go back to the workers' guilds, participate in that pagan worship. And then they, they started to get blessed with the, the treasure of this world. They got money again. They got their jobs back. Um, I've seen Christians that have compromised themselves morally and compromised themselves ethically in order to get a good job so that they got more money. And then later on they said, I was praying that God would give me a good job and now look, I've got a good job and I've got money. But actually what they did is they sinned and compromised to get that job. So God didn't give them that job at all. I think that we've got to come back and start saying, in the long term... Whose blessing do you want? That's, right. That's the key. Because in the short term, Satan will bless your socks off. You hear that? You, you obey him. You follow his rules. He'll bless your socks off. He'll give you what you want. In the long term, you'll suffer. Something for us to think about. Because this church had moved into this toleration, compromise. The woman Jezebel is now encouraging them into this. And she's encouraging uh, sexual immorality. And she's also encouraging the whole thing of uh, getting involved with the idol feasts. Not just eating food offered to an idol, but in getting involved with the idol feasts. So the Lord says, I've given her some time to repent of her immorality, but she is unwilling mm. And so even the grace of Jesus was over this woman who was causing so much deception and spiritual problems in the church. But he had grace. He says, I've given her grace to repent. I've given her a season for her to, to deal with this thing. And I've convicted her by my spirit. But she has not listened. And so now the judgment is coming. So I will cast her on a bed of suffering and I'll make those who commit adultery with her to suffer intensely unless they repent of her ways. Um, so he says, okay, I've given her opportunity to repent. She hasn't repented. She's continued in idolatry and uh, spiritual adultery and sexual immorality and promoting this and deceiving my servants. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to throw her into a bed of suffering. Um, in the New Testament... There are several sources of suffering that come into Christians' lives. And by the way, Jesus suffered on the cross. If you can suffer for righteousness' sake. I think that the Christians in Thyatira that refused to compromise and stood their ground and they lost their jobs and they lost their livelihood, some of them lost their houses and they had to really struggle financially, they were suffering, but they were suffering for Jesus. And, and if you suffer for Jesus, by the way, in the end you get his blessing. Okay? So that's one source of suffering. But the other source of suffering is sin. Your own sin, your own compromise can cause your own suffering to come into your life. And uh, it says in 1 Corinthians that there were some people and they were taking communion. And communion says we have communion with, with God through Jesus Christ. And we're taking the communion emblems to show that we're in an intimate relationship with God through Jesus. And thank you, Jesus, for your forgiveness. And thank you, Jesus, for your salvation. But there were some people taking communion unworthily. And because they took communion unworthily, it says that many of you have fallen sick. There was a sickness amongst the Christians because they were sinning and not confessing their sin unrepentedly taking communion and just thinking the blood of Jesus covers me anyway. I'm forgiven, I'm covered. And it goes on and says, actually some of you have fallen asleep. And in, in New Testament language, that means some of you have died. Some have died. Because they, they had taken the communion unworthily. that They had not honoured and respected um, what Christ has done on the cross and so this is what Thyatira, they're in that danger of that sort of thing. 
And that's why in the context of that, Paul says in 1 Corinthians, if you would judge yourself, you would not be judged. And judgment is a good thing when you would judge yourself from the heart of Christ and you would see if there's sin. Because it says in James chapter 5, confess your sin one to another, then you'll be healed. Isn't that interesting? It talks about there's all these people in the church and they're sick. There's physical sickness, there's emotional sickness, there's mental sickness, you name it. There's all sorts of sicknesses we can struggle with. And it says, when you're sick, go to the elders and ask for them for prayer and they'll anoint you with oil. The prayer of faith will heal the sick. But then it says, confess your sin one to another, then you'll be healed. So I'm just making that, um, emphasizing that. Because now this woman has refused to repent of her sin. She's been given a season where it's like unhindered. She's been promoting sin in the church. She seems to get away with it. And now the Lord Jesus says, that's it, no more. And I'm going to throw her in her sickbed. She's going to get so dreadfully sick, even to the point of death. And and again, that was like Jesus' last opportunity, uh, giving her her last opportunity to repent. Sometimes all hell breaking loose is because Jesus said, okay, I'm going to open the door, let all hell break loose um, so that you don't have to go into all hell. Yeah. I'd rather you experience all hell in this life than experience all hell in eternity. Yeah. Okay, This is the mercy of God, by the way. I don't like giving my daughters a spank. When they're naughty, you've got to spank them. and Sometimes you get out the stick, and I believe in, in giving uh, the stick... And we give them the smack on the backside. I don't enjoy it. It's not like, oh, can you please be naughty again? I just can't wait to get that stick out. I really enjoy this. I'm not like that. <laughs> um, I don't enjoy it, but I have to do it. I'd rather them get a sore backside now than end up in prison with their life messed up because they're on drugs and they're going to get beaten up by the other women in prison. You know what I'm saying? It's like, I'd rather...